And then she was like, I hate having this in here. I want to eat them all the time. And I was like, hey, I'll oh, help. Yeah. <laughs> Grabbed a whole big handful and put it in my breast pocket and nice. ate them all. And now oh, I yeah. feel, you feel kind gross. of terrible. Do so you have that like kind of gritty, like raw feeling in your mouth? I find that way with, did, I, with certain candies like Skittles. That's how I, I did. It. I did. I'm, I'm, I'm okay now. <laughs> I'm just going to drink coffee and deal with it. I'm sure I'm sure coffee is going to help a lot in the situation <laughs> after a ton of sugar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I almost had some tea, but the ones I had in my uh, desk drawer seemed to have expired in 2018. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. A little throwback there. Nice. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, let's get into it here, shall we? Let's do it. All right. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 19 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. And I am Drew Brown. And I'm actually reading the intro today, so I won't screw it up. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about what factors can impact your line width on the page, what happens behind the scenes from behind, from the time that we find out about a new product to the time that we actually launch it on the site, and which fountain pens are most loved and hated by the fountain pen community, among several other things. It's gonna be a good one today, Drew. I'm feeling that I'm feeling sounds good about really. It. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, I think we're uh, we're finally gonna maybe figure it out here in episode 19. That said, we're gonna go. It's gonna go sideways, and it's gonna yeah, be don't say really that. interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Drew is just telling me about the giant handful of Skittles he ate beforehand, and now he's got coffee, so he's gonna be all amped up. <laughs> on this Either one, that, sure. or I'm just gonna totally crash, and you're gonna have to just do this solo. Yeah. Well. If I have to, I could go on talking aimlessly about pens by myself. Oh, that's true. I've the been people known need to do me. <laughs> the people need me. I will I will persevere. That's right. Get those yay comments. You got to earn them. All right. Starting out with the first segment that we've got, our feedback. Drew, tell us what people think in the comments. Well, one of my favorite things coming out of last week's show, Brian, was a spirited and educational conversation about chard. Um... I had one distinguished gentleman agree with me, said, you know what, Brian does look like a charred guy. And um, then... <laughs> I don't know how to take that. <laughs> and then it actually it spawned like a, like a discussion. And then it spawned like a discussion about charred, where someone was like, what's charred? Oh, it's this. Well, I actually... Oh, well, I used to do this. Like, it was like a legit charred discussion that also wow. um, went into the... Uh, touched on the effects of charred on the human digestive system. But uh, oh, yeah. either way, it's like, it was... It's like, it's like spinach without all the flavor. <laughs> <laughs> it was educational. I was very happy to have contributed in some way to such a distinguished and educational um, conversation. So, um, there you go. yeah. And then Kim on YouTube says, "Totally agree. Totally agree with Noodler's Cayenne because that was mm. one of my underrated inks from last mm -hmm. week. My first order from Goulet included a surprise me random ink sample, and it was Noodler's Cayenne. I did nice. not think of myself as someone who would like reddish oranges, but I'm so glad that I was sent a sample. I love it." I now always try to include a random ink sample with my order because I might get an ink I love but would have never ordered myself. Thanks, Goulet, for the random ink option. That is Kit, what's up. That is what's up. Kim, that's one of our most popular products. Yeah, the actually. random ink sample. Now, granted, it's a very inexpensive product, but by volume, it is our number one selling product is the random ink sample for exactly that reason, Kim, because you never know what you might actually like until it's like in your hands and you're like, well... I already bought it, so I might as well use it. And then it could turn out to be a sleeper, one of your favorites yeah, and, that you didn't even know. It helps me to um, uh, narrow things down a little bit because sometimes with so many inks, it's such a target-rich environment, right? You don't even know where to begin. So just picking a random ink sample, I believe last week Brian said when we were talking about underrated inks that pretty much anything that came out in the last five years that has flown under his radar would very likely be an underrated ink for him just because even he who works here has not had the opportunity to try them all. So like, mm -hmm. where do you even begin? Random ink sample, that's where. Blamo, perfect. Uh, Jessica on YouTube says, Rui Donk is one of my favorites. I think more of rose petals, but peachy. I love how it shades and blue ice is one of my new favorites great punch with that one i don't know if she means blue water ice yeah that was in Oster reference one, to yeah. that was in yeah. reference to some of your underrated inks from yeah. last year last week 
Blue Water Ice is just so good. So good. I'm going to ink that up in something soon. Um, and then Wanted Visuals on YouTube says, if you're looking for a truly spooky episode for Halloween, maybe a live stream of Brian going through all his pens and cleaning up one that he finds inked up until he's left with three inked up pens. You guys talk about it so much, it's reached Bay State Blue proportions of boogeyman fame. So, What do you uh, have yeah. to say about that? Yeah, that would be uh, that'd be a very long and arduous live stream, I think. Uh, that said, I have on a number of occasions live stream, especially on Instagram, uh, just me cleaning my pens like late on a Friday night. And surprisingly, a good number of people join in. They have, have had more than 100 people on several occasions watch me clean so, pens. So so dispel or confirm this boogeyman myth for us, Brian. If, if it were revealed, you know, how many pens you have inked up and to what degrees their crustitude... Oh. Well, well, I would. It, it, would I, it actually be as scary as it sounds, or has this, or is this like Bay State Blue and a little bit blown out of proportion? You know what? Honestly, I would be on that journey with you because I don't even know for sure <laughs> oh, no. how many pens I have inked up and have mm. left. Because I definitely have pens that I have like sort of like in storage where I go to pull it out and I'm like, oh, this is not clean, and it's been in there for three years. You know that. That happens sometimes. Now, granted, you know, Drew, at the office, I do. So I have team members that will borrow pens and do use various things, you know, not to blame anybody, but it is possible that it was used or cleaned to some degree, but not to the umpteenth degree, you know, and it could have been put back in by somebody else or more likely it was probably me and I just put it back in there and was in a rush and then I forgot about it for years. Um, so my guess is I would have a few dozen that are that are inked that are, you know, but that's a rough guess. I don't really know. I have several different places where I have pens, which is what's dangerous because then I lose track of them and they're in cases and some of them are closed and some of them are like inside a three pen case that's buried in my backpack that I haven't used in a while. And I pull it out and I'm like, oh, I, I didn't realize that was in there. You know, so it happens. Okay. No, this is a horror film. This <laughs> is, a, yeah, I would rather watch anything oh my god yeah um yeah i went in i actually went into your office to see if i could grab a pen the other day and i think that now correct me if i'm wrong but it seems like since the pandemic began and you've been working from home more mm -hmm. when you take a pen from your office you don't tend to return anything to your pen collection in your office do you that is not 100 percent true but oh okay it's, it's I see, I, yeah I'll return, it seems like yeah. they okay it seems like most of them are like disappearing slowly that is not untrue Okay, <laughs> um, but I will I will bring pens. I don't have like a one in one out policy. I will I will okay. bring the, I'll bring them back in batches. You know, so it's especially if I have like okay whatever the you know new Lamy All Star video that we shot earlier this year. I brought home a ton of All Stars. I brought them all back except for like maybe one or two just to have as examples or whatever. So um, yeah, but it's uh, it's been an interesting situation especially as like yeah if i'd known at the beginning of this pandemic that i was going to be home this long i would have created a better system for myself but it's been obviously evolving and unfolding and i've been it in this, has you know as we all feel we have been been in this temporary state for a non-temporary amount of time in yeah. retrospect and that's like okay at some point i really gotta figure this out but maybe tomorrow you know my, one of my favorite quotes, I think it was Mark Twain, said, never put off until tomorrow what you can do the day after tomorrow. So I uh, keep that firmly in mind when it comes to pen cleaning. Anyway, let's talk about some new stuff, shall we? Let's. All right. One new thing that we have is actually a Lamy product, which is always exciting for people because Lamy is a very popular brand and they put out good pens. Uh, this is a white red Lamy limited edition Safari and it's gonna be set to release next week. We have it up on the site now and uh, we have some uh, you know, stock imagery, I believe. I think we're waiting to take our own images until we get it or we something, do. but anyway, it's up on the site now. It's uh, essentially a white Safari with some red accents. It's got a little red I don't know, would you call that the center band? It's the band behind the grip. It's not really a center band because it's not on the cap, but whatever, it's the center of the body of the pen. And then it's got a red clip as well. So I don't know if you're if you're familiar with like the, the white Lamy Joy that had the red, red accents and stuff like that. It's kind of like that, except it's in a Safari, which is kind of cool. Um, it's gonna be 2960 and it's gonna have a free bottle of Lamy Vibrant Pink Ink. So it's, it's kind of a special thing. It's a one shot deal. So it's not gonna be available forever, but if you like it, if you like the white pen, situation uh you can check it out it's going to be extra fine 
fine and medium stainless steel nibs. And then we are also it's on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. We have the ST DuPont Space Odyssey. This is their limited edition, and it is way more limited and far more edition than what you <laughs> see with the Lamy. I don't know what that means, but whatever. Uh, so this is going to be a Yurushi lacquer finished pen. So it's a metal pen with Yurushi lacquer finish. It's not common to have Yurushi lacquer in general, but then to have it on a basically non-Japanese pen is pretty rare. Um, and I excuse the pun, but I would say that this pen looks out of this world. I know it's a little corny, but I mean, really, it looks phenomenal. So it's very space themed, especially if you look at the big set, which is the, the collector set. It's got a pen that, I mean, looks like a rocket ship. Like it has the fins and the thing, you know, it's got everything on there, the rocket boosters. Um, it's got a base to it that looks like the launch pad. It's got an extra rollerball grip, if that matters to you. Um, it's got a bottle of ink. It's got um, a lighter as well, which looks like you know a lunar lander, which is pretty cool. The lighter, I think, comes out of the base of that lunar lander, and you can use it if you like to light things on fire. It's got a set of matching cufflinks as well, which have little space suits on it, which is pretty cool. And then an ashtray as well for the things that you like to burn. So there you go. Very cool, and it comes in this awesome looking box with this really cool star pattern on it. I mean, it is very much a collector's item. So the that's the big set. You're pushing 10 grand with that set. It's a whole big thing. The, it just, I'll say it just looks phenomenal. I mean, the, the finish that they put on this pen looks almost three dimensional. I mean, obviously any type of lacquer you have with a bunch of layers like this, you're gonna get more depth to it anyway, but just the way that they did, this pattern looks like you're looking at some kind of, um, what's the word, Drew? Not supernova, but like a, a, a thing. Lots of stars. You look at them. Galaxy thing. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Is there an A word? A word that starts with an A that I'm thinking of? It's like a whole bunch of groups of stars. Maybe mm. I'm just thinking Andromeda. That's the name of a yeah. something. I don't know space as well. But anyway, it's a very, very cool looking pen. And uh, yeah, from what you I might, you might be think you might you might be thinking of the word nebula. Nebula, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. Ne ne nebulas are like very kind of like gaseous and multicolored. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's probably what I'm thinking. Okay, probably okay. what I'm thinking of nebula. Yeah, so it's got that. It looks like a you know very far away looking cluster of stars and things. Um, looks very very cool though. Um, so that's the big set. Uh, there are a couple of less addition <laughs> to go with my previous statement. Less of an addition. Um, so there's a writing set that has the same like rocket ship body pen with that base as well as a rollerball grip and the ink that is $4,200. And then there's one that's just the fountain pen, which is not the same rocket ship body, um, but it's more of, of a variation of the model line D, which is their traditional model, um, which is still really, really cool looking that has that same awesome Yurushi finish with the Nebula design on it. And that one is just under $1,600. So very much a collector's item, a bit much to save up for, for the average individual, but it looks pretty darn cool. And if you're into space, um, it's pretty cool. You know, we had last year, we had the From Paris with Love, which was this really cool involved set. This is that equivalent for them this year. And uh, I don't know, it looks pretty awesome. What do you think, Drew, as a, as a space aficionado yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, the the thing I like the most about this is that they did not go with a traditional, um, I guess, historical space theme. We saw a lot around mm. 2020, 2019 of, of commemorative space pens because it yeah. was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing and such. So we saw a lot of actual space things. This one is very much in the um kind of mid-century sci-fi vein with yeah. the the large you know um you know uh, kind of the classic version of the spaceship the rocket ship more of like mm -hmm. a retro future sort of deal and i actually really mm -hmm. like that design i'm glad they went that route instead of another historically accurate pen because i think that we've got they're great but we got enough of them yeah, it's somewhat uh, somewhat conceptual, I guess, mm -hmm. still with the idea, but not going for like the accuracy of a design of yeah. a specific rocket kind of thing. The it's ship, the ship that, looks you know. more like the Marvin the Martian ship and less like Saturn V. Yeah, exactly, which I think is pretty darn cool. And it's got yeah. kind of that general cigar shape to it, which is 
you know, pretty nice. So it's, so it's very appealing. I, I dig it. I dig it. And it's, it's gone over pretty well from what I understand too. I haven't talked to some, some of the folks from, you know, DuPont that have gone to some pen shows. There's not a lot of them happening, but there's a couple. Um, yeah, it's gone over really well in person. Um, the pen looks really, really cool. So that's what I got. Drew, what do you have that's new? Well, Brian, I'm going to keep in the same theme because hey. Colorverse released a new set of inks. And as we know, Colorverse likes all the spaces. So they spaced out once again with the Constellation set. And they have named all of the inks in this new set after uh, Star uh, uh, Constellations. There you go. And more specifically about like the bright star in that constellation. So they all have like the little tiny A, which denotes alpha, and then the scientific notation of that constellation. Instead of Ursa Major, it's U-M-A for Ursa Major. So it's a little confusing, to be honest, but the colors are nice. They're a little subdued, but like good subdued, not super wild and crazy. They're very, they're, they're rich and well-designed, but not too loud if you hmm. want something a little bit more subtle, which sometimes you do. Um, but uh, I actually had to look up a few things about these, and one of the names was just Alpha Boo, B-O-O. And I was like, what the heck is Alpha Boo or A Boo? <laughs> it just says A Boo. I, when I was drawing the swabs, Brian, I just wrote Colorverse A Boo. I was like, well, I have no idea what's going on here. What am I even doing? <laughs> right. So I, lo I looked it up, and it is the Constellation... B O O T E S, like oh, bo booties, 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 boots. Um, it's actually pronounced booties. That makes more sense than booties. There you go. So I said that for a comical effect. <laughs> there's your education there, booties, booties. Mm. Mm. And but Rolls here's the, the thing, tongue. Brian. He, here's the thing I have a problem with. At first I was like, okay, cool, I got it. But then I learned more that gave me more problems. The alpha star in the Buotis constellation is called Arcturus. Mm. And that sounds awesome. That does sound cool. Like if they're going with they they literally named it Alpha Buotis, but mm -hmm. the alpha star is Arcturus. And Arcturus sounds like the monster at the end of a video game maze that you have to fight once you get to the center. Like, that's cool. Yeah. So why didn't they just call it Arcturus? I don't know. Anyway. Good question. That's, that's it for asked, me. They should have asked you before they came up with these. I, I tell you. I tell you. I mean, a boo sounds great, too. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy <laughs> saying that quite a bit. That's right. But that's that's Colorverse Volume 2 Constellation. Check it out if you like any of the colors but don't want to commit. As we mentioned before, we have samples. So, yes. hooray for that. Also, we mentioned last week that we were considering and kind of looking at a brand called Y Studio. We mm -hmm. have since said yay to that brand, and we will be launching the first pen of that brand in the Goulet Pen Company website called the Revolve. Mm. And it is a brass fountain pen, uh, Taiwanese made with a Schmidt German nib. Um, all brass, most of them colored brass with exposed brass on the edges of the faceted body mm -hmm. except there is one that's just all raw brass but the interesting thing about these is that they are meant to be weathered and worn and i found that pretty fascinating because it was the first time i have ever encountered anything like that they even come with a piece of sandpaper for you to kind of intentionally destroy it so yes it should um, be noted that sandpaper is not for tuning your nib you will have a bad day if you use it for that. You have a very but bad is, day. And it is for scratching up the outside of your pen, though. And also, if you decide to totally destroy this thing and say, you know what, I don't like the way it looks right now, try to return it, we might have a conversation about that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I, I do like the fact that this paint on the outside of the brass is supposed to, even without the sandpaper, it's supposed to, like, weather and, you know, kind of get beat up mm -hmm. over the years if you use it as a pocket pen, you know, beating around with your keys and stuff. It's kind of supposed to do that. And I just think of, like, old playground equipment that started all brightly colored, but then mm. kind of some of the steel shows through, like, on old hand railings, you know? So, I don't know. I kind of like the look of that, and it, I, I wish there was a way we could kind of, like, expedite that process for the sake of product education, I don't know what we would do. I guess we could like just know. carry it around in your pocket with a. Oh, no, we could put it. In, we we could do, Brian. Know. We could put it in your lower cargo pocket because you always talk about how that that out mm. that lower pocket just swings around and knocks into things. It does. It does. Put it in there with some pebbles. Yeah, absolutely. I get it. That's that's I basically mean, that's basically a rock tumbler right there. You can pretty much you can carry all kinds <laughs> of stuff down in there. So much room in those pockets. 
All right, and then finally, we also launched the Monteverde Monza in Ebony Wood. So this is the first wood Monza pen, the Monza we've been selling for a while. And uh, at $36, it is a pretty darn affordable wooden pen as well. So that is available. It is there in uh, extra fine, fine, medium, and uh, an Omniflex. So uh, it's a pretty good looking pen for the price. So you can check that out if you are so inclined. I also did mention the Y Studio Revolve is going for 140, and the uh, individual Constellation inks from Colorverse are 2750. There you go. And Good that's stuff. it for new stuff. Yeah, there's definitely more new stuff coming, but that's all we got to talk about right now. And Drew, I do want to mention the cargo shorts that I'm currently wearing at the moment. They have pockets on the outside of the cargo pocket, so it's like double pocket. Oh yeah! Wow. So if you need like <laughs> something tenderized, you put it in there, and yeah, it's if you want to gonna... not be, yeah. And you know what's really funny is I'm I seem to be like a really good height for, um, you know, if I have the pockets unbuttoned or whatever. A lot of times they'll grab on to the knobs of the lower cabinet doors in my kitchen. So like as I'm cooking or doing the dishes, I'm constantly like getting hooked on the doors and whatnot. It's pretty. It's pretty funny. <laughs> so I don't know. Do the door? Do the doors open when you walk away? It depends which door it grabs, you know what I mean? Like if oh, it right. grabs if it grabs a door that's on the left side and I'm walking right. to the left, it's gonna wanna open it up. But if it's the right one, it's gonna like wanna rip my pocket off. So I don't know. <laughs> it's durable, I can take it. I haven't yet broken anything. But uh, yeah, it does catch me off guard sometimes. So I'll randomly be doing stuff in the kitchen and I'm just like, ah! I'm like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, ah, my pocket hooked on the thing. She's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> she doesn't have, she doesn't have something about it. Anyway. I All like right, the noise. <laughs> you know me, Drew. I mean, you make similar noises too. Come on, I do. You know I do. Noi noises happen now. These days, anytime I make, like, I'm on the ground a lot with my dog and my kid, and <laughs> I, I don't stand up without making a noise. So that doesn't oh, happen yeah. anymore. Yeah, you're reaching grunt status when you <laughs> yeah, get, absolutely when you change change altitudes. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, good stuff. Um, all right, let's move on to some Q and A. Right, we got some really good questions this week. Um, we Drew, do. I, yeah. In, we. we, it, we the, I think we're going to say the same thing. Go ahead. We have a theme. Yeah. We do. The theme is emails. These are all questions that came through email because we do look at those from time to time. Um, yeah. So good stuff there. And we're trying something new. We're trying to somewhat structure our question answering a little bit. So whoever asks the question, it's going to be the other person that is the primary answerer. And that will ping, kind of ping pong back and forth. So we're going to try that out and see how it works. We are reaching so, a new level of intentional effort here that's on the right. Boulay Pencast. Yes, we are evolving. If we were Pokemon, we would be evolving to the next evolution, whatever it's there called. There we go. Monster. There we go. <laughs> and uh, we'll probably be eating our words in about an hour. Anyway, I'm going to kick things off with an email from Carolyn. And Carolyn writes, I'm a fan of broad nibs and most finer nibs. Oh, I'm a fan of brawn dibs, and most finer nibs just don't lay down enough ink for me to enjoy the ink. I always am kind of amazed by the writing ink reviews that I see because the wide lines they appear to get from fine and medium nibs. One of my fountain pen pals said in a letter, I'm surprised at the narrow lines you get with broad nibs. You must write really fast. And I thought, of course, because I do tend to scribble. It isn't that I'm using an absorbent paper because I write letters on Tomoe River loose sheets. So she and I are right that the writing speed can produce a widely different range of results from the exact same nib and pen. And is this something you have observed among yourselves too? It might be fun to pass the same pen around the office and have everyone write a sentence and see the variety. Thanks so much for the weekly chatter. Really enjoy the pen of the week segment a lot. Oh, well. Whoops. We're, we um, blew it. We blew it this week, but we'll get anyway, to that later. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind about that pen of the week. Um, yeah. But no, the, is... the the primary question here is: yeah. Do you ever find that your writing speed can affect the width of the line being put down, Brian? Yeah. So I I think first off, thank you, Carolyn. I'm kind of with you. I I myself find that I think my handwriting is better with broader nibs. But there are a lot of people who say that their handwriting is better with finer nibs, which I just think is so interesting that it varies so much with different people. But um, I do think that writing speed can be a factor, yes. So to answer your question a little bit, however, I don't think that it's probably the dominant factor in terms of line width. So I'm, I'm going to broaden up the topic just a little bit here beyond just writing speed because it got me kind of thinking about 
what are the factors that get into line width as a whole, right? So obviously nib size is going to be the most impactful factor of line width. If you have a very, very tiny ball of tipping material and a fine or extra fine nib, there's no way it's gonna write as broad of a line as a broad or a stub or something like that. So yes, the physical characteristics of the tip of the nib are gonna be the sole biggest factor. However, there's a number of other factors and I'm gonna sort of go in somewhat of an order of what I think may actually be sort of the highest to lowest factors. Um, I think paper absorbency, as you mentioned, Carolyn, in your email, I think it makes a huge difference actually. And you mentioned that you're using the Tomoe River Loose Sheets, which is an extremely ink resistant paper. So if you think about that, if the ink is being resisted by the paper, it's not soaking into the paper, therefore it's pooling up into a more concentrated area. It's not soaking into the paper and then spreading out on the paper fibers. So if you have a really ink resistant paper with a lot of coating, a lot of sizing and stuff like that, you're gonna have a finer line than you would with the exact, exact same ink and pen setup than you would if you had a really absorbent paper like maybe an inkjet paper or newsprint or something like that or a cotton fiber paper. So I think that actually is probably playing a bigger factor into your personal situation here is the paper that you're using, though it's not the only factor. So I'm gonna keep on going. Um, I think the ink itself can also be a factor, how much it flows, how much the ink itself has a tendency to absorb because there are different viscosities and things like that. Now. All fountain pen ink is going to be some sort of water base, so the viscosity is probably not going to not going to vary super drastically. Um, but I'm thinking, especially in situations like where you have a quick dry ink, um, you know, those quick dry inks and things like the Diatramentis document inks and things like that. Anything that's made to dry quickly and really stay put is going to have flow characteristics designed in that ink to make it absorb and spread into the paper. Um, and so, of course, if you combine that with a really absorbent paper, it's going to do it that much more. Um, but the reason a quick dry ink is usually quick drying actually doesn't have that much to do with how quick the ink is, you know, like with the water is evaporating out of the ink or anything like that. It has to do with how quickly it's absorbing into the paper so that when you are touching it on the surface, you're not actually smearing it. So it's not having a tendency to pool up on top. And you know, I've talked a lot about like inkjet printers versus laser toner printers. So those quick dry inks act more like an inkjet printer ink where it absorbs into the paper so that it doesn't smear. It maybe isn't necessarily even drying faster in totality. It's just spreading out more so that it doesn't pool up on the top. Um, whereas a laser toner paper, it's sitting on the top. That's what you're gonna have with your more you know, uh, absorbance resistant inks like your Noodler's X Feather and your high sheening inks like Organic Studio Nitrogen and, you know, some of these other things. Um, certainly anything with pigment in it, like a shimmering ink, that stuff sits on the surface so you can smear it for a long, long time, whatever the paper might be. Um, so the ink itself can be a factor to varying degrees. I think writing pressure, and if you're talking about actually your writing technique, I think the pressure, the amount of pressure you use is actually a bigger factor than your writing speed. Now I'm up for debate on this, Drew, but I think that that is probably a bigger factor, mainly because when you're pressing down, excuse me, particularly at a lower angle, you are spreading the tines apart and you're allowing more ink to flow through and you're effectively broadening up that nib mechanically when you're using increased pressure. So I think that that is probably a greater factor in terms of technique than maybe your speed. Um, also have to mention that writing angle. So like, you know, you have your sheet of paper on the writing surface, right? So your writing angle, how you're holding the pen, maybe I should actually grab a pen. So your writing angle like this. If you have a very low angle, that means your pen is gonna be more parallel to the page. A very steep angle means it's gonna be more perpendicular to the page. Generally speaking, it depends on the nib grind and how it's how it's shaped, but generally speaking, the lower the pen angle, the, the broader, the wetter your pen may write. Again, this does vary depending on the grind, but that's sort of what I've found 
is a somewhat universal um, factor. And then the rotation has to do with literally the, how much the pen is rotated in your hand. This is not so much of a fine tuning. It's a little bit of like, if you have it you know, more or less centered, it's fine. As you really start to roll it off, you start to kind of break the capillary action for the slit of that nib. And it can start to dry up and get a finer line if you have it at a kind of steep angle, but then it'll eventually just kind of stop. So it's not so much that you should rotate the pen in your hand to try to fine tune the line width. It's more if you're, it's writing too dry or it's skipping or whatever, just double check and make sure you don't have it over rotated because then it will just basically cause you problems being too dry than it will be if you have it just held properly. Um, and that can also depend a lot on the specific nib grind, things like a stub or an italic where it's ground really flat like that, much more sensitive to the rotation because you know the slit of that nib is being lifted off and it's got a little less tolerance than a perfectly round tip would have. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, writing speed definitely does come into play, but honestly, I don't know how to like specifically isolate writing speed from all these other factors. So while I do believe that it plays somewhat of a factor, I don't know in and of itself if it matters to a, a hugely great degree. Um, I would have to believe that it does, but you know, I think it's something that honestly, this question just like prompted me more to think about it and think like, I wonder if there's a way that we could, I don't know, test for it or something. Cause and the challenge is when you, even if you have different people that write with different speeds, they're also going to have different angles and rotations and pressures and all these other things. How do you truly isolate just the writing speed? You know, cause I think that, you know, in my own practicality, I tend to write heavier when I'm going fast. I don't know if you feel that way, Drew, but I, when I'm really going fast, I'm like, I'm more aggressive with my writing. So I tend to write actually darker the faster I write because I'm putting more writing pressure on, but that may vary quite a bit based on the individual. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I will say that while you were talking, I just casually, you know, I still have this lovely 823 inked up with uh, Noodler's Golden Brown here. And I just very quickly drew a horizontal left to right line very quickly. And then that same line right below it, very slowly, and it is about a nibs a nib size higher when I write slowly. So it hmm. like you like you said, it definitely plays a factor. But of course, there are other factors that can go on as well. So I mean, yeah. writing slowly definitely does allow the line to thicken up a bit. With this paper, this is just copy paper, but it's I suspect it's what you were saying, Brian, about it having more time to actually absorb into the paper. You know what? We a way to test this. Actually, I'm, I just thought of this as you were talking. Eureka. Have you ever seen those? I can't even remember what the thing is called, but it's basically like a CNC like pen holder. Do you know? Yeah, what like I mean? what it's Edison like a, has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Gray's got one of these things. Maybe I'll maybe I'll prompt him. He's a busy guy. I've been but, trying you know. to get you to buy one for a couple I mean, of years they're like, now. They're like four hundred bucks, man. It's we can like, totally do it. We just it's need a, a good really reason. expensive toy. I mean, it would, ah. be a, it would be a fully justifiable business purchase, especially Absolutely. since we got asked about it. So I don't know. I can't remember what the thing is called now. Do you remember what it's called? Like the, a plotter. Yeah, it, that's that's basically what it is. But there's a, there's a specific one that's made for holding pens. But anyway, Robo plotter. The yeah, I don't know. The um, <laughs> that's not it. But the uh, no. the, uh, the the idea behind that would be, it's a machine that holds the pen, you know, exactly the same specific angle and stuff like that. And you could program it to write the exact same thing essentially at different speeds, I think. I actually don't know if you can program it to write in different speeds. That would be the thing to figure out. But anyway, that's essentially what you would need is to have all other factors controlled and then only change the speed and see how much of a difference it makes. Because I don't know, even with your test there, I would I would question whether your writing pressure is consistent, you know, when you write slow versus fast. Well, I, 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 agree. I, I agree with you. If anything, my the, the fast one was more pressure, but it's still thinner. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe I'm just really going hard on the pressure when I write fast, but <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'll observe myself. This could be one of those things that, you know, thinking about it, I'm remembering it differently than it is in reality, which happens all the time. So, um, yeah, just, just do a yeah. quick left and right stroke slowly and a quick one and uh, another one, well, just slow and fast and see what it does. Maybe I should do that right now. Let me see what there I got you go. here. Hey, look what I've got, Drew. I have my A23 right here. Look at that. Yeah, we uh, okay. we didn't unink these and ink it up anything new. All right, let's see here. No, I have not cleaned mine yet. Add it to my pile. To your horror film pile. Okay, it is writing a little broader when I 
right slower yeah i mean it makes sense right like yeah it's it's one writing... of it's it's definitely one of many considerations i always write slower because i feel like i write cleaner because if i write fast i tend to over rotate because i'm not paying attention to my grip oh, yeah. as much and things just i get it, it gets more skippy for me and so i yeah. don't like writing slow yeah definitely yeah uh, yeah true makes sense the slower the uh, as i'm writing slower is definitely a little thicker i think to a point like once you get you know, it's not like infinitely variable, but there will be a point where, you know, it's going to make a difference. So, yeah, good question. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, basically slow down and you'll get a truer writing form with better handwriting and everything. It definitely pays to write slow, but um, lots and lots and lots of factors in there. So kind of cool. Thank you, Carolyn, for prompting with that question. Thank you very right. much. Yeah, this next one we have is from Nunu on YouTube. Okay, what are the best browns, Drew? And then another one to follow up if you want to lump them together. Alexandra on YouTube says, Autumn is here and brown is a great fall color. So please tell us, Drew. And I just realized these are not actually email questions. So we broke our own theme, Drew. We did. We did. But they're Whoops. double questions. So Drew made an exception for himself on this one because it had brown as the topic. I think that's what's going on. So can't really blame him. Anyway, go ahead, Drew. You're the expert. This, this, is, this is actually has come up a few different times, so I figured I would go ahead and sure. answer some of my favorite browns. So we're going to start off with brown inks. So I'm going to tier these in order of just kind of like what they do for you. So Noodler's Golden Brown, which I've been writing with a lot recently, is kind of like I'm on the honeymoon phase with it. So this one, if, you're, if you want a shading brown, Noodler's Golden Brown is phenomenal, and it'll give you a nice fun fall vibe and honestly the one i go to the most over the years and years and years is plain old noodler's brown it's not a fun name to write though so i generally tend to go with either noodler's beaver or noodler's walnut because i just like writing the names of my inks a lot and i write brown enough because it's my last name so i wanted something different those but are, noodler's so brown, those are noodler's objectively brown is solid those are objectively very solid browns though absolutely i can, I can say that being unbiased myself i, I think they're yeah. very good it's hard colors. to deviate from noodler's Noodlers makes good browns. Um, mm -hmm. I have been a big fan of L. Lawrence for a while, which is a dark green, but Noodlers Burma Road Brown is actually a very similar ink, but leaning a little bit more toward brown. And it's a good alternative that I found because there was a while where L. Lawrence was not available and I went with uh, BRB. And then Rome Burning is a light brown, but it is a funky, fun ink to write with. It dries really flat and weird, especially if you're using a broad nib or a stub nib. It's a fun, very strange ink that I recommend you giving a try just because it's unconventional. It also changes color in water, so that's something that not every ink does. And then recently when we began carrying Private Reserve again, I noticed that their ebony brown was mm -hmm. actually a very, very rich, very dark brown. So if you're looking for a brown that is also very professional, if you're in a business setting, you want something really close to black, but far enough away from black that you're gonna know that it's something special, PR, um, PR ebony brown. Mm, nice. And then another new ink that came my way was Diplomat Caramel, which is a light brown, as you can imagine. Mm. But I would say that that falls under the sleeper hit category of this list because mm. I thought it was really nice. doesn't shade quite as well as Noodler's Golden Brown, but it is a lighter brown, so it does have some of that property going on. And honestly, I, I really like the name. I'm surprised more browns aren't named Caramel. And finally, rounding out my ink list is Jacques Urban Carub de Chipre. That one is my shimmer brown entry for this list because why not add some shimmer? And the Jacques Urban series of inks that have shimmer in them are not going to be as high maintenance as a lot of other shimmer inks are. So you have that going for you too. This is actually probably the least shimmery of the 1670 series i think i recently swabbed them all up and this one yeah. isn't quite as audacious as some of the other ones too yeah probably and i think the the color of the shimmer is more closely matched to the color of the ink so it doesn't contrast quite as much so maybe a little bit of visual trickery there i don't know if the actual density of the shimmer is different you might but be I right think, i think it stands out maybe a little less than like a you know emerald of chavor or um you know blue ocean or something like that Absolutely. And then moving on to brown pens, because we have brown pens too. 823 is obviously the best. This is by far the most popular, most well-purchased and well-regarded brown pen oh, yeah. on the modern fountain pen market today. No disputing that. So, And it also, even if you're not a fan of gold furniture on your pens, this 
amber brown really brings out the gold so beautiful pairing there but moving off from that the sailor compass only 30 bucks for that wonderful pen is a great way to get an affordable brown pen in your collection so i have to mention that one it also comes with a brown converter making the list as the only brown converter so extra points for that and then the lamy lx marron is a beautiful beautiful brown pen the lamy all-star coffee brown has been discontinued for a while but honestly the marron is pretty darn nice because you have that nice you know uh plated clip and the plated finial it's just the whole whole complete package on that one and then stepping up in price, you've got the Peniter Arco with gold trim, previously only available with silver trim. They recently added the gold. And like I said, with the 823, the gold and the brown, that earth tone lushness, just mm, it's a delightful, delightful thing. And the quill nib on that pen is choice. So I recommend at least looking at it because it's so pretty. And then finally, the ST DuPont Line D in Atelier Brown. This pen is only available if you already happen to be the owner of a Scotch decanter sitting next to a leather chair. Um, and uh, if you don't have one of those, you have to buy one of those before you buy this pen. It's kind of a prerequisite. It is but, a requirement, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if you look at this pen, you'll know why. Like, it just looks like it needs to be in a wood paneled library with a leather chair. Like, it is. It's a nice looking pen. It actually feels really well too. It's just like the Space Odyssey pen that Brian mentioned earlier. It's got that nice lacquer and it's it's one of, uh, I think it's the most beautiful uh, S2 DuPont pen we have, but I am mm -hmm. biased and that's okay. I'm not trying yeah. to pretend I'm not. You need to be somewhere in the vicinity of mahogany to be able to fully enjoy that, I think. Vicinity of mahogany. Yeah, yes, sir. Exactly. But um, that's my list. I'm absolutely no expert, but I like brown things and my last name is brown and that gives me zero credibility yeah i don't know the end you're you're not a dr brown like stephen brown is, no so. i'm not maybe maybe that this is my my attempt i'm just trying to uh i'm, I'm clearly growing out my my beard to look more like stephen brown you know you do like tweed yeah well i'm, I'm working on it i'm working on it yeah we'll see um it's hard for me to build upon that because you have a very very solid list i have a couple of inks that i thought of kind of as you were talking mm. um die mine ancient copper oh it's not, beautiful it's not a shimmer ink i think it's it's it might be our most popular brown ink it's way up there if it's not um but uh it's it's again not not a true like chocolate brown um and it doesn't have shimmer to it but it's got a little something in there it's got a little something special so kind of a coppery brown but a very very popular in color that one definitely you get uh your your you know barnacle barney barney will show up on that one for sure um a couple of really good chocolate brown colors as you were talking i thought of diamine chocolate brown and pr chocolate mm -hmm. that's pr chocolate with no chocolate on the end yeah <laughs> um both really good they're very very similar colors um but a nice dark like hershey brown color uh, i dig that um uh, hope we don't get a strike on that no no uh copyright strike because we referenced a trademark anyway uh and then noodlers 41 brown i know you've been a fan of that one in the past you didn't mention it so i thought i'd bring it i up. know That's, i know there's just so many good I, browns i mean you can't I had, say everything I, had, I thought about it i had so many noodlers browns on there already yeah yeah and then why not throw stephen brown in there he's got you know the sbre brown that's a great does. too yeah. we don't sell Ak it but ackerman you know. makes that absolutely absolutely i bought, I bought um, one came came to me from uh from uh, uh the other go. ones but in my opinion, the best brown is a Drew Brown. <gasps> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Drew, you want to kick off? Would the you like one? another question? I would love another question. All right. Hey, this comes to us from our friend Alan, um, who is a uh, longtime customer and pen friend of ours. Thank Alan you. asks, what happens behind the scenes from time from the time you hear about a new product up until the time it is on the site how do you make all the measurements like ink capacity alan why did you uh, brian's gonna okay um also he asks the new diamine ink vent calendar is exciting did diamine make m a bunch more of them this year all right brian you've got some notes on alan's first comments about you all that know, you had to know what was going to happen when you threw this question in here drew well, let's, let's start. I, I, let's start. I was like, this is going to be a slice already. I can tell you, it's just such. It's going to be such a comprehensive question. <laughs> um, first off, we'll talk about the ink vent thing. Yes, 
I do believe, I mean, I don't know what the total supply was, but we definitely got more than we had before. Definitely so, more, yeah. You know, last year they sold out, not last year, last time, two years ago, it sold out in hours. This time, thankfully, we've had them a little bit longer. We do still have them as of the time we're recording this, so I think it's not too late, but I think they're they're moving along nicely, and I think they're going to. Um, they're going to go, especially, you know, if they get in people's hands and they really like the colors and other people see how excited they get, then the rest of them are going to go immediately, so... Um, but to get to the main bulk of the question here, what happens behind the scenes? Basically, like, how do we launch a product, right? So it's a lot. I'm going to go just going to warn you here a little bit. Um, so first this, thing. This is, this is actually a little just fun, fun story here. Like, Alan actually reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and asked about something. And I kind of mentioned, like, oh, well, yeah, we have to do this. But first we do this. And then first we do this. And he's like, oh, hmm. my God, you guys, you guys do a lot before you launch a product. So I think that this was kind of him saying what, teed up, if, teed it up what else thing. what else happens <laughs> yeah well it's great so i mean we talked about this before to varying degrees but i just like the way that you phrase the question alan and uh you know just kind of like float out of me as i was typing the notes so i'm gonna go through here i'm not gonna cover every exhausted detail because honestly i'm just gonna hit the the bullet points of what happens but it is a lot um so first thing First thing first is we have to get enough information to understand what the product even is and decide if we need to carry it or not, because we don't just carry everything, right? Um, and we have to know to what degree we're gonna carry it. So lots of times for a pen example, are we gonna carry every nib size, every color option? You know, there's often ballpoint, pencil, rollerball, fountain, blah, 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 all these different versions of things when a new product launches, assuming it's a pen. Um, so yes, there's lots of debate that we have on our products team. There's lots of number crunching. We look at past sales. We use some gut kind of influence there to think of how much we think it's gonna do. Um, and then assuming that we're a yes on that, we have to basically, you know, place our initial purchase order with whatever the company is, which involves a mix of math and gut decisions. Oftentimes we have mm, somewhat limited information because it's brand new. We don't have all the details. We more than likely have not seen it in person, maybe not even seen a picture. Sometimes we just have to go off of some raw, raw facts about the thing. And then we have to make a commitment to buy them. Um, so that's some kind of a little tough. Um, there's a lot of logistical information that we need to gather, right? So once we've decided, yeah, we're going to actually carry this thing, there's things like UPCs, product codes, you know, the various SKUs and just straight up numbers that we need to get them into our system. Um, the price, you know, the price, the, the different options like nib sizes, is it, you know, uh, uh, if it's an ink, you know, is it coming in a bottle or a cartridge or whatever configuration it's in, et cetera. Um, a lot of that's specific to the product type, you know, notebooks have their own various things to decide. Um, and then we need to know you know, the dates that we think that things are going to be scheduled to arrive, you know, is this something that's going to be, you know, available immediately and we can have it in three days if we place the order, or is it something that's not arriving until the holiday season and we need to order them because that will make a big difference in terms of how much time we have to prepare and, you know, what else is going on at that time. Um, and then, you know, is that something that's going to be made public? So sometimes we get told about things and they're like, okay, we're telling you this so that you can, you know, place an order, but, you know, do not share this publicly until such and such a date. You know, it's really popular for, you know, certain things uh, that, that they want, like a coordinated release, like, you know, just as an example, like Retro 51, when they do their poppers. Granted, we do not get a lot of advance notice on those at all, but, you know, we do have to order them <laughs> before we can, you know, they're public and they can be released. So we need to know at least a little bit and so there's always that consideration to be made when it's public and what's still private. Um, there's, you know, copy stock images, things like that, that the manufacturer um, will hopefully provide us. It's not always the case. Um, and then we have to program all this into our accounting system, our inventory system, our warehouse management system. We have to create the product page on the website itself. And then possibly any category pages or anything like that. If it's a new brand, if it's a new model, there's more involved with setting that up on the website than it's just a, you know, than it's, it's ooh, I'm getting really excited, Drew. I'm tripping over myself. If it's just an existing model and we're adding a color or a nib size or something, it's much less involved. If it's a whole new thing, there's a lot more just structurally on the website to create there. Um, and then we have to get all the accurate like SKU and product information, all those you know measurements and details and stuff that you talked about, um, which basically we never get all of that upfront. So we have to 
you know, figure out a lot of that stuff kind of as we go. A lot of back and forth with our suppliers to get as much information as we can. And then sometimes we have to basically figure it out ourselves once we get the product in hand, which I'll get to in a second. Um, we have to physically make room for it in our warehouse with all the appropriate labeling and bins and all these things. We have to create barcodes that we scan because we use scanners and all that kind of stuff. We're more sophisticated now than we used to be, which is great for speed and accuracy for our, you know, receiving team and our fulfillment team. But it's just extra steps in there to set up all these new products. Um, then we have the detailed information, like if we're taking our own images, measuring the ink capacity, like you asked about, doing Nibnook writing samples, if it's a new nib that we've never written with before, taking detailed measurements of the grip and the length of the pen and all that stuff, that's not often ever provided in any fashion. So we have to do all that in-house. So if we're able to coordinate getting a sample of whatever the thing is ahead of time, that's great because then we physically have the thing and assuming there are no changes made, which is not always the case, you know, when it launches, then we can have it ahead of time. But it's not unusual for us to have to wait until the actual full shipment arrives for launch. And then we are like, okay, we're gonna build in one day or two days or whatever to get all this extra information on there so that when we launch, we have all this accurate information. Sometimes if it's like a big, you know, Twisby launch or something that's like super time sensitive and we know we're gonna be the last ones to get it, you know, we'll just go ahead and launch and then add that stuff in as quickly as we can. But usually we like to try to wait and have all that information in there, but it's kind of a balance because it takes time to do all these measurements and stuff. Um, for the actual details of the measurements, we've come up with some very specific processes that we do so that at least we can be standardized. Of course, there's not you know, any particular standard out there in the industry for how some of this is done. So we basically had to come up with it ourselves. So um, we've tried to do what makes the most sense. Um, you know, we use, um, you know, pretty detailed measuring tools, like we use digital calipers to measure the, the length of the pens and the grip diameter and stuff like that. Um, we have digital scales that we use to measure weight, you know, that measure to the hundredth of a gram, so pretty darn accurate. Um, for things like the ink capacity, since you specifically called that out, um, a neat little thing that we discovered um, when measuring ink capacity to get it the most accurate way possible um, was actually to use weight to measure the ink capacity of a pen, which Sounds kind of weird at first until you understand kind of the concept of it and then you're like, oh, that's actually pretty clever. Um, so what we do is we take the measurement of, you know, the pen, just as, as little of the pen as we need to. You know, we're not measuring the cap in this portion of it because that doesn't matter at all. It's just like the body of the pen, the part that's gonna be holding the ink. So we'll measure that completely empty, never been filled before. And then we fill it up all the way with water till it will not fit a single drop more. That's to get like the max capacity, right? So that's gonna be more than you would have just with a conventional fill because there's usually a little air bubble in there, but that could vary on every pen and all that. So we're like, okay, the most consistent way that we can do it is to just max it out. So that's exactly what we do. We fill it to the complete max and then we weigh it again. And the difference between the pen when it's full of water or ink, they weigh the same because it's mostly, ink is mostly water. Um, you know, when you look at the um, displacement of water in terms of milliliters or cc's, it's actually the exact same as the weight of water in grams. So whatever the weight difference is between a full pen and an empty pen with that ink capacity in there, you just measure that weight in grams and that is your milliliter ink capacity. Isn't that clever? So we figured that trick out a while ago and that's how we started doing it. Um, it does get a little more complicated with these pen um, ink capacities when you have a pen that can fill with different options. So like a pen that has a cartridge, a converter, or in Pilot's case, multiple converters. Maybe it's eyedropper convertible, right? So there's all these different things. Well, how do you measure all that? So essentially what we have is this like big robust spreadsheet with every pen, every option that we have, with every essentially component that we have. So like we'll take the grip of one pen and then we'll have, you know, the ink capacity of, you know, for example, Lamy Safari, right? So we'll have like the ink capacity of the grip section of a Lamy Safari in our spreadsheet. And then we have the ink capacity of the cartridge and then the ink capacity of the Z24 converter, or sorry, Z20. Z26 converter, I'm going back in time here. Z26 converter, Z28, whatever. Oh, Z26 is outdated too, dang on. Z28, Z27. So anyway, we have all these different options, everything saved in there separately, and then we add them together. That's why when you go on the website and you see incapacity of cartridge converter, whatever, those are really accurate and we stand by those, but we had to measure those components separately and then add them together with math. Whew. I'm still going here. Okay. so. 
everything up to this point is probably still behind the scenes, especially if the product hasn't actually yet been publicized, right? So this is all happening with every single product that we're preparing to launch, right? Um, and this could potentially be months in advance. So there's, this is churning. And then we, we launch, I don't know, anywhere between 100 and 200 SKUs a month. So that's a lot of different things that we're trying to coordinate. Um, we have to communicate all of this various information across our various teams. You know, certain teams need different information. You know, the product code that's used doesn't really matter to customer care team so much, but it matters a lot to our receiving team and to our fulfillment team. You know, how the pen is actually used doesn't really matter so much to our fulfillment team, but it matters a lot to customer care and to our marketing team. So there's all these different components and that's why we have a team that makes these product decisions is because we all bring different things to the table. We have different focuses and we'd all kind of come together and we approach things from different perspectives not only to make the initial decisions, but then we decide, okay, what's the right way to kind of focus this pen or this ink or whatever, and how do we want to display it? How do we want to market it? What are its strengths and that kind of thing? Um, so we have to communicate that and share that out with everybody on our team so that when we launch it, people know what the heck it is. Then we plan out the launch dates, which are always subject to change, especially right now with all the delays in shipping and so on. And then we have to come up with a promotion plan. How are we gonna talk about this thing? How do we wanna display it on the website, do social media, emails, newsletters, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then all of that has to be held on very loosely because you know, we will very often get shorted on our initial orders. We try to do the best math we can to say, okay, what's the demand gonna be? How are we gonna meet that demand? But then of course it's going to be different if we get shorted or half the shipment arrives and you know, two of the nib sizes are still with whatever UPS or FedEx and we don't get it for another four days. Do we hold the first part of the shipment and launch and other people are already selling it? Do we launch the fine and the medium nib if the broad is still on the truck? This stuff happens literally every day behind the scenes. And then once all the stars align and we physically get the products in hand and we have them, then we have to actually inspect and verify that they are what we thought they would be and make sure that the color is actually accurate to what we thought, especially if we didn't get a sample ahead of time. But even if we get a sample, we still like to verify because sometimes things change from the sample to the actual final shipment. And Drew knows because this is part of what he does is inspect all these things as they come in. Um, sometimes we're surprised and have to adapt at the very last minute. But once all that stuff is aligned, everybody's communicated with and then we set a time and we say okay this thing is now good to launch and then we launch it and that's that's the very high level <laughs> of what we are doing literally every single day that we do most of this behind the scenes to launch every single product that we carry it's super involved but we've honed it over year and year and year over year over year and gotten it down really well um to a you know pretty adaptable but yet stable state and uh yeah that's 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 lifting up and peeking behind the curtain there Whew. now i'm out of breath yes adapt adaptable is most certainly a very important term for all of this and any of the things that he mentioned could have been broken out into an equally long sub segment like just just the meetings that we have about new products are oh, yeah. they, even that has a very very precise structure things that need to be crossed off the list considerations past product research that needs to be done like we try to do it right and that that's something that i'm really proud of is that whenever something doesn't go right or we realize something could be made better we do it or we do our very best to make it better so what we have is the result of noticing many things that didn't go well and addressing many things uh, so that they can go better and we're still doing that every day absolutely and we love doing it honestly it is even after doing this 12 years 10 years you know it is it is still keeps things exciting <laughs> every single day and we never yeah. have the same day twice ever <laughs> no <laughs> never oh my goodness all right there you go that's a deep enough dive now i get to ask a question and i'm gonna chill while drew gets to answer this one so this next one comes from elizabeth who says i heard a rumor that you can put the paniter pen filler directly mm -hmm. on a 15 mil bottle of diamine. I don't know what that is, but uh, how cool would that be? Maybe you could try that out for us, test for leaks, et cetera. And then there's a follow-up question, but I'll let you I'll let you answer that one first, Drew. So I think she means the the 30 mil bottle, the smaller diamine bottle, because I'm not aware yeah. of a 15 mil, 
right? No, no. There is a 12 mil that comes in this year's Inkvent calendar. Uh, well, either way, Elizabeth, I tried them both. And uh, the short answer is don't listen to that rumor. Yeah. None of it is true. It doesn't, doesn't uh, work, right? It, to my knowledge, the mouth on the 30 mil diamine bottle is the most narrow ink bottle mouth that we sell. And the Penider pen filler just kind of it's pretty narrow. The, the, di- the diameter of the opening is pretty much equal to the diameter of the ink bottle. So yeah. it definitely does not, the, the diameter of the ink bottle definitely does not fit inside of the Penider pen filler. Yeah, so um, I can I can understand the desire because you can't fit many pens into that 30 mil bottle without right. some kind of adaptation, right? Yeah, but it definitely does not work. I even tried the little blue rubber thing to go over it, and it's it's too tight. It doesn't. It also does not work with the tiny little ink vent bottles either. So, um, don't listen to that rumor. It definitely does not work. But then again, it also doesn't work even closely. So there's really no risk in even making that attempt. The I mean, diameters. They're I'm both lo- very similar, right? I'm, I'm looking at it. They they do look fairly similar. Yeah, they're but almost I think identical. They're, yeah, let me, uh, I don't know. Let me give it a try. Let me give it a try. Because sometimes I don't trust Drew. So I got to verify wow, it for okay. myself. Wow, okay. Wow, the you faith. Know. Yeah, it definitely does not work. So. I mean, the blue thing can fit in there. I don't know how tight that is. It feels like it might be a little loose. But let me see what I can do. I just want to prove Drew wrong. That would feel so good. Oh, wait, right you're doing now. that? Yeah, what did you that do? Doesn't, that does, that's not going to do anything, Brian. You're just putting the cap on. There's no reservoir. No, the little stopper here, this thing, it fits oh. into the rubber part. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. I was doing the opposite thing. I thought you were trying to fill, put the ink into the uh, no. thing. Oh, I did the wrong thing, Elizabeth. Pardon yeah. me. See, okay. Well, honestly, Drew, either okay. way, it's not. So the thread pattern looks similar, but this thread is fatter. It's just like a chunkier thread than what's on the Peniter. So it's getting lopsided and it's not, it's not really threading on there. Not okay, in any so way I would feel confident. You know, it just wants to I go thought lopsided. We were, I thought we were trying to decant the bottle into the filler, but you're trying to make a filler out I'm of the bottle. I'm trying to make a filler out I'm trying to make a 30 mil bottle filler. Oh, okay. That is not which, what I tried. Sorry, I this, misunderstood this the question. This filler already, this is, t- it says 10 mil and it says not to go above the, you could, I don't know, what are we going to do? Um, Something, but, who knows what uh, could happen. But it's not working. It's not working for me. Yeah, and just I to, just to verify, I'm going to see if I can fit the, the 30 mil cap on there. I mean, I can, but it's a loose, it's a loose fit. So I don't have any confidence yeah, that's actually going to hold. Too, so too, too risky there. I would say it's, it's it's not recommended. I wouldn't recommend doing this. It's no, too sketchy no, for no. me. Very, but yeah, for sure. That's a you, lot of ink. If you have an empty thing like this, you can pretty much just like pour this right in there and then carry on. So I don't know what it's really. Yeah, buy, I, don't, I don't know what it's really buying you to be honest to be able to to do that because unless unless you have the ability to swap both caps easily, you're not buying yourself anything. Because say you do put this thing on your 30 mil bottle, well then. You know, well, I guess if you if this was empty, never mind. I was like, if you already have this filled, what are you gonna do? It's like, oh, you put this in something else, or just don't have it yeah. filled in the first place. But no, I don't think just it works. just 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 pour it in there. Just pour it in there. It doesn't work. That's what now, it's for. Well, I will say this is a really old thirty mil bottle. Maybe they've changed it. I don't know. This is like, I mean, this was the this was the first. I bought this at the pen show in 2009. This is my... Oh, my God. No, no, no. It's not that old. Sorry, sorry. This is my Majestic Blue. This is probably 10 or 11 years old. Still. So maybe they've changed it. I don't know. Do you have a 30 mil bottle handy, Drew? No, it's... not not in here. I can okay. run and grab one while you do the next question if you want me to. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. All right. I'll, I'll run out. Um, but for Elizabeth's next portion of the question, she asks, I recently figured out pretty quickly that my Visconti Rembrandt, uh, well, I can't leave ink or water inside the cap because the magnet oh. ring mm-hmm. will start to rust or deteriorate. That got me wondering, are there other caps that you either shouldn't clean with water or need to make sure they are completely dry? Crap. And <laughs> Sorry, Drew. I literally just snapped the cap of this trying to thread it on here. I was oh, like, God. hey, that's kind of fitting. And then it just snapped. And I was like, crap. Now I have <laughs> my pen oh, filler still got ink in it. So yeah definitively can say now you might you might ruin your pen filler oh shucks crap oh well <laughs> see we talked about this, this last year how, how, Bri- before, where it's like, how brian's gonna, not afraid to break things i'm gonna push things a little bit further than yeah. you probably should because if i break it at least it's mine and that's exactly yep. what happened so anyway, anyway regarding sorry, the totally uh, interrupted you go ahead the magnet in the rembrandt elizabeth the magnets usually have iron in them that is a you know com- 
component of the attraction of the magnet. They use iron to attract. And iron is absolutely very, very rust prone when it comes to combining it with water and oxygen. So even if the magnet is coated or has some sort of protective thing around it, any homeowner will tell you water always finds a way in. It's something that it's just, it, it always finds a way. So if you do have to clean a cap with a magnet or even any metal in the cap, unless you absolutely have to, unless you're dealing with just chaos in your cap, ink, explosion, we're talking just ink everywhere, just get a cotton swab, go in there, get the ink off. Like what I do is I take, um, let's see, where's my pen flush? I don't have my pen flush. Anyway, I just take my pen flush. I just hold it upside down on a cotton swab to soak the cotton swab. And I do a first pass with that. Um, unless it's really inky, then I just kind of like twist up a paper towel and get that in there. Either way, go as minimal as you can at first. You don't want to just totally flush your entire cap with metal components unless you are just that needs to be done. And if you do need to do that, get it dry as quickly as possible. Because in addition to any potential magnets, the pen manufacturers generally don't put uh, the metal components inside of the caps are not really meant to withstand you know being submerged in ink or water they're just they're they don't pay attention to that most of the time yeah. sometimes with other parts of the pen they might you know say all right let's make sure this is stainless steel mm -hmm. you know but the inside the cap they generally don't do that so it's a good practice to always make sure that your cap is not wet for long periods of time so um cotton swabs are great twisted paper towel works just fine as well um but uh if you do have to get it all wet dry it as much as you can yeah so, and then let, let it air dry as well yeah and then to to kind of reinforce that too you know it's it's the it's the it's the makeup of the magnet i mean it's literally just physics you know the magnet has that iron in it it's going to rust with any type of moisture i mean we know we've talked to some manufacturers before about like you know, is there a coating or something that can be put on? And the answer is yes. Like some manufacturers do put coatings on those magnets. Um, but even still, that's not a surefire bet because, you know, even if you put a coating on it, it's like then that could potentially mess with whatever adhesive is used to keep the magnet in there. So there's always a balance between properly securing the magnet in place and waterproofing it and all that. It's it's a little tough. But I can also say it's it's not super common to have you know, a rusty magnet cause like a major problem. I mean, yes, if you look down in there and it really bothers you, that's one thing, but I haven't had it like be a major functional issue in most circumstances. So a pen like the Rembrandt there, it's popular. There's a lot of Rembrandts out there. Really haven't had a lot of like complaints long-term of that being a thing. Um, even if it gets, you know, rusty a little bit to some degree in there, again, that's the nature of the magnet specifically itself. Um, and that happens across different brands. Um, but uh, hasn't ever caused such a large issue that I think you should lose a whole lot of sleep over it. That's true. Unless it becomes so rusty to the point where it starts bubbling up and becoming sharp and could cause scratching to, you know, a metal grip section or something like that. Yeah. Um, but generally, that's not the case. Like Brian said, we've been selling that pen for a long time, and it's certainly not a pervasive issue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You ready for question number five, Brian? We're going to finish this thing up. Yeah, I think so. All right. Well, Sam via email says, yo. In the last episode, Brian mentioned that every pen has someone who loves it and someone who hates it. Someone's least, fan, least favorite pen is someone else's absolute favorite pen, etc., etc. My question is, what do you guys think is the most universally beloved fountain pen? What do you think is the most universally hated fountain pen and why? It would be fun to hear them in different price points too, like most universally loved cheaper pen, most universally loved expensive pen. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Good question, Sam. When I first read it, I was like, you acknowledge that I said that every pen has somebody that loves and hates it. And then you immediately asked me like, what's the pen that everybody loves? What's the pen that everybody hates? <laughs> but you said most universally loved. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take that with the best. You're also giving Brian here. a hypothetical. So good luck with that. Yeah. Good luck with that. I'm going to dance around this thing. Like <laughs> it's a, like it's a maypole, right? <laughs> Um, anyway. All right. Hey, I'm going to go find a, uh, a bottle of ink. Do you still want me to do that? Yeah. If you could just, to, I mean, right. yeah, if you could, I'll go just, check. I ruined mine, but I would like to confirm. <laughs> okay. It. I'll go get a modern bottle. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Drew's going to go get a modern 30 mil dye mine and he's going to leave me alone while I dance around this question. 
like it's the safety dance. All right, so there is nothing universal here, as I mentioned before, um, but I think I'm gonna, you know, interpret this more as like, what are the ones that tend to be more popular, right? Like what's more generally well-liked, generally disliked a little bit more, because I really think that's what you're getting at, Sam. Um, in the lower price point, I think that, you know, it's pretty common. We have some videos out there, fountain pens for newbies, parts one and two. Those are good ones to look at. Um, there's ones that, you know, basically the answer for any of these is if you go on our website and you sort by popularity, it's gonna sort the most popular ones at the top. But some of that's sorted by color and stuff and it's hard to round up whole models. So I'm gonna talk just in whole models here and it's not really based on any firm one specific number. It's just purely off my own interpretation. Um, Pilot Metropolitan or the MR tends to be quite popular. Lamy Safari, old standby for a long, long, long time. Um, the Twisby Eco also is incredibly popular, has been for basically ever since it came out. Twisby 580, I didn't know whether this one should be in like a lower price or more of a mid price because it kind of dances between the two. But if you know, whatever, throw it in here if you want to. It's very popular right there along with the Eco. Um, definitely on the low end, the Jinhao Shark Pen, super duper popular. Uh, Platinum Preppy has been long been a staple uh, of the affordable pens, especially if you do an eyedropper conversion. It's like one of the most eyedropperable, affordable pens out there. And then Diplomat Magnum has been a more popular one on the scene uh, in the last couple of years. Certainly there are others, kind of an honorable mention to the Quebec Sport. You know, I think that that, I wouldn't say that's as universal because I think there's a lot of people that, you know, aren't as into that pen or they think they like it and they don't. I experienced that myself when I first got into it. I thought I would really like it, but it's just too small to use practically. So again, has a big fan following. Um, so, I mean, you could throw it in there too. This is a completely subjective list. Um, in the mid price, Pens, I guess. I kind of broke it into a low, mid, and high with no firm criteria. Mid-priced, uh, maybe like the $50 to $140-ish. I'm thinking like anything. It's like that next level category sub kind of gold nibs. Um, this one is tougher. There's really not as many clear front runners. You get a really wide mix of pen models and you get a lot of varying opinions. Um, and so, you know, I think that there are some like the Conklin Duragraph pretty popular a lot of different models been out there Lamy studio comes to mind that one's you know pretty pretty generally well liked um, by those who own them I, I did twisby definitely dances all up in this area so if you want to throw that in there with this criteria is a lot of different twisby models 580s alr the vac 700 and the various minis and all that kind of stuff they kind of cross over between these low and mid prices um you know but but it's going to be kind of all over the place in this range. I think that this whole mid-priced pen here is just a really, you get a wide swath. There's so many different options and there's so many different varying opinions that people have about them um, that uh, it's, it's not as clear what the universally loved pens are in this range. Um, I think if you go in the, the higher end pens, like the gold nib kind of on up, I think when you go into the I'll call them like the more affordable gold nib, the entry level gold nib pens. There are definitely some clearer front runners. Lamy 2000, the Pilot Vanishing Point, maybe throw the Decimo in there as an honorable mention. Um, Pilot Custom 823, that's a little pricier, but still very popular and aspirational for many people. Um, definitely Sailor, you know, they're 1911 in Pro Gear. Essentially, they're very similar pens, just slight variances on the shape, but. Um, you know, there's a lot of different variations in colors and stuff of that, but any, you know, those are all pretty, pretty generally accepted. Platinum 3776 would fit in there too. Um, but I think that, you know, when you get into these higher end pens, it gets really, it gets really interesting because expectations start to rise and um, there's a lot, you know, more niche kind of specialized, unique features that tend to pull in certain directions, whether it's the material of the pen, the theming, the type of nib, the type of filling mechanism, whatever, that don't lend themselves as much to universality with the higher end pens. You tend to get a lot more special editions, limited editions, more obscure things that I think, um, you know, if there is a universal appeal to them, some people, you know, either will love them and some people will feel let down by them for whatever degree because they paid a lot for it and their expectation maybe, you know, in a different place than what a particular pen has to offer. So we see a lot of very differing opinions on some high-end pens, but you know the ones I mentioned are generally pretty well accepted. Um, the ones that are universally hated, <laughs> honestly, I think 
take any of these ones that are universally loved and you're going to have a different group of people that are going to universally hate them if for no other reason than for the fact that most other people love them and it's just like apple or tesla or whatever insert any brand here that people like there's going to be a group of people that just want to bash it because it's what a lot of people like um but just in general i think that you know any pen that tends to be really popular is going to get talked about a lot and is going to attract a lot of hate as much as anything and when you have as many individual opinions and a hobby like fountain pens um you know certainly you're going to have that mixture in there um, but then you're going to have um, some other pens up i had to put noodler's pens in here now noodlers is very nuanced there's a lot of people that love noodlers pens there's a ton of them out there it's super affordable they are really such a different pen than what just about anything else has so they do get a lot of love however they also get a lot of hate because you get some of the highly placed expectations as you would have with more expensive pens but applied to a noodlers pen and then Nathan specifically designed the Noodler's pens to be user serviceable and tweakable. And, you know, you can take them apart, you can adjust them, you can, you know, heat set the ebonite feeds and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of people then feel like they don't want to have to do all that stuff. And they kind of just want a set it and forget it kind of thing. So that gets a lot of pushback. So it's just a really interesting Noodler's kind of just gets a big you know, caveat with this whole thing, because despite its affordable price, I think some people do have some really high expectations of what these pens should be able to do that I think may or may not be very fair in a lot of instances. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, kind of mixed or negative feedback on some of the copycat pens that are out there. This is more of a, just a general category of pen. Ones that essentially kind of like mimic very popular models, you know, where it's pretty obvious that a manufacturer, usually not as much of a name brand manufacturer, makes something that is heavily inspired by, something that is much more stronger branded, popular, not specifically a counterfeit so to speak, because it doesn't have the original brands on it, but you can pretty much look and be like, oh, they definitely just, just copied that design and tweaked it enough so that they wouldn't get the pants sued off them, you know? But it's like, some people are all about it because they're like, they get a, a bargain of a pen. It's usually, you know, a fraction of the price. But I think generally speaking, a lot of people in the pen world, they can kind of tell when that's happening and it feels a little bit like cheating. It feels like it's maybe, you know, not fair and maybe undermines the main brand, which is like clearly just really there to support, you know, the heart of the community. And some of the other ones, it feels a little bit like a money grab. And, and uh, again, I'm not speaking about a specific manufacturer here, interpret it as you will. Um, but there are several brands out there that they have a little bit more of a model of, you know, kind of mimicking more popular brands. And it's clear that they're doing so to try to essentially ride off the popularity of a more established brand. And that's, you know, generally not the favorite of people who are deep in the fountain pen world, at least. And I would say just anything that's like an outright fake or a counterfeit is pretty universally disliked. Um, you know, especially if somebody thinks that they're actually buying the real thing. But, you know, like anything, there's, there's people out there that have a following i mean you can go on reddit and you can see all these people who love who love buying fakes and trying to spot the fake things and like it's pretty obvious they know that what they're buying it's like too good of a price and they can kind of tell um you know but this they, they just love the the cheapos and the fakes and the counter you know all that kind of stuff so everything's got a following um to speak to what i said at the beginning where it's like you know anything that somebody loves somebody else is going to hate and vice versa um but i think you know um generally speaking people like to see you know innovation and, and kind of uniqueness going on out there so anything that's too close to something else is going to get is going to get a lot of friction and that's what i got drew very good no i completely agree with all that i know you got i knew you missed a little bit at the beginning um but uh oh you know, that's your, fine your no, notes was, here oh. we talked about some of the same stuff um, but yeah, yeah, I think I think that it, it reminded what you said about noodlers kind of reminded me of when the uh, first generation Omniflex nib hit the market. Yeah. I think that uh, that one got a lot of flack because for the price point, there was a high, high expectation for that nib and it just didn't yeah. deliver. So um, they've got it much more tuned in now, completely different manufacturer making that thing. But right when they launched, um, they sold like crazy because everybody wanted it to be this it's a flex pen and it did not do magical things and right. that you and it was know, like a, um, a 60 dollar flex pen at that so it was still really affordable for what it yeah, was absolutely absolutely and but like noodlers it you know uh i think people wanted more than they got and it was pretty disappointing for many um but i will say that they have made 
leaps and bounds worth of improvements on that pen. So the OmniFlexes of the current generation are completely different, like not even comparable Absolutely. to Absolutely. what was sold then. So uh, yeah, that, that popped into my mind, especially when you're talking about noodlers. Yeah, anything with the word flex on it, you just know is going to bring the yeah, drama. It's, not, it's never going to deliver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, good stuff. That's all we got for Q&As. But Drew, I see that we have the hypothetical section coming up yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, this one is, is going to be less of a hypothetical, Brian, and more mm. of just something I want to know. Um, mm. I, was, uh, I had a really great conversation with my family about this. Okay. Um, this this past weekend, and lines were drawn. Whoa. Debate was debate was had, hmm. and uh, relationships were placed in jeopardy. Wow, bridges not, were burned. Uh, bridges were scores burned. were um, settled. No, I. Uh, this was also in 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 addition to someone who uh, last week commented about. Um, uh, I forget why, but some somehow we mentioned an oatmeal cream pie. I don't know what we were talking about, but um, I want to know, Brian, what is your favorite hostess or Little Debbie cake? Ooh. Are uh, you an oatmeal pie guy, cosmic brownie? I have a really Swiss good cake. Swiss, I have a really Swiss good, cake roll. I have a really good, really heartwarming answer for this actually really and it's that not going to be well that depends what day of the week nope. it is what's the temperature outside it's what's not mars a, doing it's not a smarty pants answer it's a all right, genuine all right. genuine good answer all right but warm uh, my off, heart brian i want to give an honorable mention i i am a fan of the oatmeal pie i do yeah. i do really enjoy me some oatmeal pie you know i haven't i don't have like a I mean, I have a sweet tooth like nobody's business. <laughs> um, in fact, I was just talking with my brother-in-law this past weekend. He and I have like basically the opposite taste buds. He loves like IPAs and super hot food and really bitter stuff. He was like, yeah, if I never had to have dessert ever again the rest of my life, I'd be fine. But he's like, I want all the bitter things. He's like, give me vinegar, give me sauerkraut and horseradish and all that. And I was just like, like I can't <laughs> handle any of that stuff. Sauerkraut's like, my limit. I love spicy stuff, but oh, sauerkraut I can't do. I can't do any of that stuff, man. Mustard, not like I can't oh, do I love I can't handle any of that. Like horseradish is like my kryptonite. It's just, it's, <laughs> I can't do it. Like any sandwich that has horseradish on it, it just, it's all I taste and it lingers. Like I just, it's clearly like something about me. I just, I, I can't do it. Would, um, would horseradish be worse than black licorice for you? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. I don't like black licorice, but it, it, it I really don't what, like it. What black, about like, what really about don't just like black licorice, but you know, the good and plenties that we had a little while ago, they weren't great, but that's not the worst black licorice out there. If I have like I would, I would rather black licorice, it's pretty bad. I would rather take a, I would rather eat an entire packet of Arby's horsey sauce than eat a good and plenty. Oh my gosh, I couldn't. No, <laughs> I, the horseradish it just it 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 gets all up in my nasal passages and everything. Yeah, it legit just, horseradish is very. It just different. dominates. I can't deal with it. Anyway, um, so Kryptonite. yes, to go to go back to your question, where where did I get at with this? How did I end up talking about this nasty <laughs> stuff? You gave me a very prompting, pleasant question. Anyway, yeah, so my brother-in-law, very, very bitter taste. I'm the complete opposite. If I had to eat nothing bitter the rest of my life, I would be thrilled. I just only want sweets. That's just So what's your favorite little Debbie? So yeah, was that the question? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, love me some oatmeal pie. Great. Okay, but I I really don't I really don't buy any little Debbie on a regular basis. But um, so I have very distinct memories associated with my grandparents, my mother's parents. Um, so they they lived in town here, but they we didn't see them we didn't see them a whole ton. They raised nine kids. So by the time they had raised all their nine kids, they were like kind of done with kids. So like we would visit them, but. You know, they were they were much older and they they, they were pleasant enough, but they really didn't have any interest in like yeah, getting to done. our le getting to our level as toddlers. I would be done too. Yeah, very much so. So um, <laughs> anyway, they're great people though. So um, whenever we'd go over there, um, there was not a whole lot to do. Like they didn't have any toys for us. They really didn't. They really, didn't, you know, we were just there. We were just kind of around. So we just had like makeup stuff to do. But I remember like the highlight of my trips with my mother's parents was um, they would keep the 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 Swiss cake rolls, the little ho-hos. Mm -hmm. um, they kept them in the refrigerator. 
Ooh. And we would get a little two pack of those you know, ho hos, and I would eat them cold from the refrigerator. And of course, I would eat them immediately. So um, they were always cold, and I'd like developed all these different techniques for like because they're cold. Like the integrity is like a little firmer on those things. So I would like peel off the chocolate on the outside, and then I would like kind of you know bite the ends off to to get all the shell chocolate off, and then I would like mm-hmm. unroll the like cake part oh, and then wow. I'd like lick the frosting off from the whole other thing. You know, I had like this whole process. Wow. I would, I would tweak it and adjust it, but that was like distinct memories of that. And the reason I bring that up is because this is like the last time that I visited my parents, my mom had some of those in her refrigerator and gave them like offered them to my kids. And I was like, what like oh, i'm in a that's time warp so adorable yeah so that was like oh. oh my gosh like and my kids have a total sweet tooth too so i'm like wow like my kids are like this is like a legacy now that <laughs> and my, is amazing so my mom like offered it to them and she offered me one too and i was like yeah i want one like i, haven't <laughs> had, I don't know it's been 10 years since i've had a swiss oh, that is amazing so it's like very much associated with my grandparents who have both long since passed away. But now I'm seeing that continue like with the two, you know, my parents and kids generation. And that's just really, really kind of heartwarming. So very fond memories of the Swiss cake roll. So nothing else, like, nothing else even comes close to that. That is awesome. I was not expecting such a great answer. It was right? just something I was curious about. That's just, that is a solid answer. Thank well you. Well said. All Thank right, you. well, you got to get ready when you're, as soon as you become a grandfather, you know what you're doing. Stock that fridge. Oh yeah. Yeah, man. The biggest problem, I'm, the biggest problem is, am I going to have them on hand, or will, if they're in the fridge, like I will eat them probably. So I'll have to, <laughs> I'll have to have Rachel like hide some somewhere that I don't know about, <laughs> so that when the grandkids come over, you know, assuming that happened, you know, who knows? But you know, right? Assuming I don't. That's awesome. I wouldn't eat all the cool. rolls. Anyway, I'd, I'd also yours? love to. Oh, me, uh, oatmeal pie, and so in the. Mm. Uh, at, sometimes at gas stations, you can find like the big oatmeal pie. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Those are good. You know what I would like to see is like, you know, they have those double stuff Oreos and stuff like that. Get some like double stuff oatmeal pies, like just like really thick frosting. Mm, That's what no. I want. See, I'm not a double stuff Oreo guy. Mm. I'm like, I like the plain Oreos. I don't like too much frosting. That's, in fact, I like those little thin Oreos they sometimes have too. <sighs> that is nonsense. <laughs> what, what is the point? What it's, is the point? I, li- I like an equal distribution. It's, it's That's totally, not an equal distribution. A regular I, I like their, Oreo doesn't even have I like equal to be, distribution. It, well, well, no, no, no. I want the width of the cream to be the width of oh, the cookie. Oh, you're talking thin cookie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I've never bought any Oreo product that says thin well, no, on no. it. Well, it's... <laughs> I'm like, what's the point of this? Give me, give me mega, double ultra like something that's like yeah eat more just yeah i'm pretty yeah. pretty americanized in that yeah that way. is pretty american i also don't eat oreos um, very often just by the way though i do i you may not know by looking at me but i, I don't eat oreos that often go ahead yeah i with the, the the biggest divisive moment uh at, at our uh in during our family conversation was i made a comment about how no one likes those cream pies that are like the yellow cake with like the three random raisins stuck into the top of them um and everybody was like oh god yeah i know and then my mom and my stepdad were both like mm, that's my jam i was like oh, mother I, mean, dare you? Still, the, I don't who even still, are you they're still making them so like somebody's I know, buying no. them they're they're not so bad they're just i just never known anybody that's really loved them but i would love to see some in the comments what is your favorite little mm. hostess cake or little debbie cake i don't know if those they have those or outside whatever. of america yeah or whatever in what version i'm sure you know sometimes yeah. with products like that it's like a global company and it's like called little debbie in the u.s and it's called something right, else yeah. in europe or whatever yeah interesting like the, the zebra cake and the christmas tree cake are also pretty darn good mm-hmm. can't go wrong with those i mm-hmm. like those all right how do you feel about those uh those um oh what are they called they're like the rice with the chocolate like it's uh Oh, uh, uh, with like caramel in it. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, the, the, they're good. They're good. That's forget, that's my wife's. I forget what it's no, called. Uh, no. Um. Oh. oh gosh. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like it's like a chocolatey. It's like a hundred. Uh, it's like a hundred. Like a hundred grand, you know, candy bar. Yeah. It's like that, oh, but in like a this? patty. Yeah, oh, the fudge shoot. rounds are good too. They're like the the chocolate with a little fudgy zigzag. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, I know what you're talking about, and I do love those as well. 
I don't um, cosmic crunch is that a thing co- cosmic brownie is a thing cosmic maybe cosmic crunch is another thing i don't know star crunch that's it star crunch yeah, yeah is that what it those is those are good man i'm getting those so hungry i'm just getting so hungry right now <laughs> i want to just snack real hard star crunch yeah star crunch that's it yeah yeah no, i'm just so looks good like i had a, just looks like a big old cow patty of chocolate and <laughs> rice rice krispies i uh, still i don't even care i would i would i would kill one right now all right brian do you want to move on to the pen of the week yeah this will be a nice quick segment both drew and i independently totally dropped the ball on our pen of the week we were preparing for this yesterday and drew was like i'm so sorry brian i didn't ink up my pen i wanted to carry it around and i was like hey me too i totally didn't do anything i said i would do so yeah i was out of town this weekend not to spoil it we'll get to what's happening here in a second but I was out of town and I I even brought everything with me to eyedropper, my preppy and everything. I brought all the raw goods and didn't end up doing anything because we had four kids up there and it was just, it was madness. So yeah, I have less it, of an, I have less of an excuse. I just didn't do it, but we will by um, next time. So there you uh, go. yeah, we're just going to, we we're going to we carry, carry on, carry on our good intentions of inking up our preppies. There we go. We also figured, you know, it's a preppy. Y'all are okay. Waiting a little bit. You probably already have one or you're familiar enough or you don't care. So we'll I'm get expecting, to it. I'm expecting a earth shattering revelation, Brian, personally. Well, I am going to be using the preppy wah, which I've never used before. I'm expecting wah? an entirely different experience than a regular preppy. Not really. Anyway. All right, Drew, what's happening in our personal lives here? What do you got going on, my friend? Uh, we had some celebratory events this weekend in the Brown household or outside of the Brown household. We, uh, my wife and I recently hit our 13th wedding anniversary. Hey, so we, uh, we went on a date. Thank you. Like an actual date without the kid, which is not what? something we, we often do. I know. So what is we that? got, uh, it's, I don't know. It's crazy. It was weird. So we, uh, we went downtown to an Italian restaurant, got some overpriced tiramisu. It mm. was, uh, you know, did, did the whole date thing. And nice. then um, we, we were leaving and like, we still had some time. We're like, ah, it's not that far past his bedtime. Let's keep doing stuff. And of course, because we're super lame, we're like, you want to just kind of walk around Target? She's like, yeah, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> so we just walked and we're like, yeah, look at us walking around Target with just us. No kid. Like, I'm, I'm not going to lie. That's half of me and Rachel's date nights is like, Let's go to Target and or, yes. Home, and or Home Depot and or get yes. our, do our weekly grocery run without the kids. Right. I mean, That's our date. I mean, it feels very, very different. And, you know, what did we do? We get there. I'm like, we walked in and at first I was like, we don't need anything at Target. We, we don't have weird, random fun money right now. We don't need mm. to go to Target because all, all we needed was a birthday card for my grandmother. Um, but, of course, we go in there and just buy crap just stupid random and of course we bought we buy archer we get she sees this big fluffy stitch from lilo and stitch like a big old floppy pillow animal she's like oh we need to get him this look he's sleeping he's got little clothes i was like all right so what do we do we just buy something for the kid we're without the kid and all we can is yeah, useless yeah anyway That's so on. we did that I, and I, then the I, next I rela- day i relate i relate yeah it's just this just the way it is we're a trio and then Sunday was uh, my grandmother's 85th birthday party celebration. So we went over her nice. house and um, did that whole thing, did the cake thing, you know. And, of course, there's always something that, like, either needs to be moved or lifted or hung or removed or loaded into someone's car. So, yes. you know, it was that whole thing. So happy to happy to do that. She lives by herself now, but um, she's just – she's great. She's one of the most marvelous people in my life, and I do a lot thinking about her. And Don't you just, don't you just feel like a superhero, though, when you, like, go over to one of your relatives' house and they're like – can you can you grab that off the top of the bookshelf and you're just like yes i can oh that, that that's me your, here's your glass bowl you yeah know, and then I you're mean, just that, like, that, that's yes. that's me living with a uh, five foot two and a quarter wife <laughs> but um at but when i'm when i'm at uh, my mimi's house uh it's always i'm basically a computer hacker because her tablet's always mm. on the fritz or like her aol account isn't synced properly so i'm just like ah. Nice. Nothing. <laughs> Basically Neo from the Matrix, you know, ain't nothing but a thing. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. That's awesome. What about you? Um, did some family stuff as well. So we went up to Northern Virginia, about two hours north of us here, to Rachel's hometown area where her parents and 
uh, sister and family lives. Um, and we went to a little outdoor festival thing, little fall festival called Cox Farms. Anybody in the DC, general DC area, you've probably heard of Cox Farms. So they have like hay rides and corn maze and you can pet goats and you can go down slides made out of corrugated like drainage pipe and all this kind of stuff. It's <laughs> yep. really fun and kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's been kind of a tradition of ours ever since our kids were little and we didn't do it last year cause COVID and it wasn't open at all this year. We did it. We had masks and we had stuff like that, but the weather was like, it was perfect. It was overcast, like 70, 72 degrees. Didn't rain at all. We were there. We got there early. So there weren't as many people and it was just awesome. They have apple cider donuts there. Oh, mm. so good. They have apple cider there. If you can like fight through the yellow jackets, they're just swarming all over it. Cause that's like yellow jacket like heaven right there oh my god you so, can't get away from those things no heck no they're aggressive but they weren't like stinging everybody and whatnot but they just i mean this time of year especially yellow jackets they like apple cider is literally the perfect food for them anyway mm. so it was all good i don't care whatever i've been stung enough time i don't care <laughs> get my apple cider it's so um, sad <laughs> but that was really fun um did some really exciting plumbing work you know had a nice had a nice slow draining sink that my son's had for a while and i was like oh gosh so i was like ah it's probably clogged with hair or something like that but then i noticed like it looked kind of grimy in the in the little stopper and i was like yep yep. i was like oh there's gonna be some nastiness in there and i was like all right so i got the (sighs) little hair snake yeah. thing oh, and yeah. started the getting little... that in there it was getting stuck constantly and i kind of oh, pulled it out God. and i was like but it wasn't really getting much and i was like no. i was like nah there's just there's just nastiness up in there so i was like all right just like <sighs> rolled up the sleeves i took the whole yeah. the whole took the un- p-trap the trap apart and yeah. everything and it was just disgusting <sighs> so i cleaned the whole thing out it looks great now you know there was a part that was broken and everything oh, so you know man. it was dripping so i had i had to run to the store and get a replacement little valve thing for the stopper doohickey it's just great love oh. plumbing work love oh, plumbing God. work but you know what i did feel good doing it and it was of course i started at like 10 o'clock at night of course but it was just it was gross and i just couldn't stand it anymore and i, I did it and now it works great so i was like okay that was kind of cool i'm glad yeah glad i got through that but it was a couple hours of just like oh it was misery so gross. yeah but yeah, it was like you know what this was all already there and now it's not so it's like that's eh, probably better for my son that He's not dealing with that nastiness yeah, in his thing. it needed to happen. Yeah. Um, and then just like I've been working outside. It's this time of year around here in Virginia is just beautiful. Like I'm like, we need to stop talking because it's bright and sunny out and I need to go play outside because um, <laughs> it's like 70 degrees and perfect weather. Um, but, you know, leaves are falling. So I'm doing leaf blowing and all that kind of stuff. Did some edge repair on my driveway and just really boring stuff to talk about but just hardy manual labor that i'm just really enjoying and having a good time so spend lots of time outside that's what i'm doing that's weird all your favorite activities drew Mm. (laughs) lots of being outside and doing plumbing Woo! yeah yeah wow um i'm gonna skip the company updates because we don't really have a whole lot to report there we're just gonna jump straight to what's on our desk and then we'll wrap this thing up drew so what is on your desk my friend well brian not on my desk, but something that has been in my writing life. Uh, I, like many people, uh, have a Leuchtturm Some Lines a Day notebook, five-year journal, and like many other people, it is insanely inconsistently filled out. Mm -hmm. But uh, recently, I've been using a new tactic, Brian, and I wanted to talk about it because Mm. I bet you there are some people that have already discovered this and perhaps some people that have not yet discovered this. So I wanted to share my new tactic with you as someone who procrastinates their journaling. So what I've been doing, Mr. Goulet, is getting my phone as a millennial smartphone having constant picture taker. I will go back in my gallery and look at my photos to see what happened on certain days. And then I will look at the date for that photo and then be like, oh, right, this is what we did that day. And fill in my journal according to my picture gallery on my phone. And it was so helpful. And that way, if I miss a really fun day, I can look in my gallery and say, oh, exactly. And I can catalog it so that the journal is more filled out. It's kind of a bummer because this is uh, 2021 is the last year in my five-year journal. So right (laughs) when I discovered this 
you know, this technique. I'm like, dang it, I wish I could have discovered this back in 2017 when I got the book. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll buy another one next year and hopefully have better luck. But that was a really cool discovery for me, and I'm going to keep it up. It basically means that whenever I do have time to journal, I can journal more than one day and kind of fill out, you know, the past, uh, you know, day, two, three, four, five, several weeks. Mm. So, anyway, I've been enjoying that. Nice. And I also... Uh, put my first retro 51 rollerball through the washer and dryer oh um, no that hasn't happened yet it was my other space shuttle pen this is the newer one the enterprise but no. and i also i also had the uh discovery and the discovery got washed that's a home pen not tell me it's okay pen. though tell me it's okay it's just fine yeah just fine so I it w got washed totally, and then it was in the dryer, and I heard some uncharacteristic clanging. As see, that's the, what uh, gets it is the dryer. The dryer is what gets it, not the wash. Yeah, as as the uh, the proud haver of a seven year old, I am very used to things making appearances in the dryer and making loud noises. Mm. Homeboy brings just rocks home all the uh, time, like yeah. all the time. Like I found this piece of gravel that I thought was cool. I'm like, yeah, you did. That's that's great, buddy. Yeah. So, but this one sounded different, Brian. This was a different uh, <laughs> oh, auditory creation. Oh, I was no. like, wait a second. That's that's not that's not a random hunk of you know asphalt that the dude picked up. That's something else. <laughs> and sure enough, but it was fine. We're all good. Don't press your luck though. Um, but uh, anyway, I was happy to see that. Wow. Now the big thing that's on my desk, Brian. You don't even know. No, about this, this is a surprise. Yeah, I don't this know. This is a surprise. I don't know what you're I have, bringing up here? I have a new thing on my desk, and okay. this was a gift from a very, very special pen friend. Um, and I not don't me. know. This not was me. Uh, no, not you. Um, you're not that special. We know um, I don't give Drew things. No, but a couple episodes ago, like a couple episodes today, I talked about brown pens, and someone decided that. I needed this glorious, glorious. Is that the one that we were talking about with the bear on it? This is <gasps> the bear. I know. Drew, I, about, I, I don't even have that pen. I about died. It's got the bear. It's got the line friends bear. It's got the little thing that goes on the clip. I am on cloud nine right now. Wow. Like this, I am, I just, I can't even. I can this definitively just, say you don't deserve that, Drew. That's, oh, I agree. That I, is I, such I, a nice gift. I'm just I wholly <laughs> agree. I wholly agree. But it is going to be one of the most appreciated things I will wow. ever have in my collection. Wow. So this is on my desk right now. I don't even want to ink it up, but I'm absolutely going to ink it up. Um, mm. But I am just on cloud nine. And look, at, brown. That is so cool. That's I, really op cool. I opened this and just lost my darn mind, Brian Goulet. I, wow. I just, I, I cannot express my gratitude. So immediately what I did was, I, I do this thing. If I ever, I, I am overwhelmed with gratitude, I just like give one of my pens away. So like, I immediately just like found some, some, uh, one other of my pens and I ran out and our other Brian um, who works here, I was like, hey, do you want this pen? He's like, uh, yeah, sure. I'm like, here you go. Here's yours, yours now. Just kind of trying to pay it forward, you know, because I'm like, ah, this is too too much kindness. I need to get it, get it out there. <laughs> you can't just absorb it like the high. No, <laughs> I feel like I don't deserve it. I'm like I gotta keep it going. But, but then it's also you know keep keeping the kindness going just makes me feel better. And like there are so it's many kind people in the Fountain Bend community, and yeah. I, I love that generosity. And you know I, I do like to uh, kind of pay it forward. So yeah, um, wow, just wow. That's I, I, amazing. It is amazing. So top that. Uh. Well, I'm not going to be able to top that. That is really, really cool. I know. Um, but it is really interesting that you brought up your some lines a day because independently, I didn't even know you had that as a talking point. Um, I found my some lines a day after not knowing where it was for basically two years. Um, it was in my nightstand. But like I have like a two drawer nightstand. It was in the lower drawer, which I like never open. I guess I put it down in there at some point. It was like, oh yeah, I'll put it here. That way I'll always know where it is. And then I forgot where it was and it took me until now to find it. I was just like, yeah, it's been like, it's been a long time since I've opened that drawer. What's in there? It's like some old woodworking magazines. And I was like, oh, there's my some lines a day and two other Lloyd Sturm notebooks. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I was like, wow. I was like, okay, I've been looking for these things, but I didn't really know where they were. And I didn't look super hard enough to open random drawers. 
so yeah, I just like rediscovered several years old notebooks. So kind of a rediscovery for me. And I am exactly like you, Drew. I started my Some Lines a Day in 2017, kept up with it sporadically for a couple of years, and then I stopped. And now I'm in a quandary because I'm like, well, I have some historical record of something that happened at one point. What yeah. do I do now? Do I just like dive back in and just have this big gap? Do I start a new one? I'm like, I don't know what to do with this now. So I'm in kind of a quandary. I'm curious what you all would do. I basically have like, I don't know, it's not quite halfway filled up. Like I started in 2017, I stopped it at some point in 2019. So I have a little bit of overlap into like the three year portion of it. Like, but again, excuse me, it was kind of sporadic. So if I pick it back up, I maybe will be able to get like two more years into it. But then I'm also like, am I really gonna keep up with this thing? Cause my track record is not great. So I don't quite know what to do. But I did think it was kind of interesting. I just looked at like, what was today's entry in 2017? We're filming this on October 13th. And so on Wednesday, so I looked, I was like, oh, what is, what is it, what does it say for the 13th? Um, okay, so in 2017, I wrote Friday the 13th, just kind of an odd day. Everyone was fumbling and misfiring. <laughs> Spent one and a half hours talking with Rachel tonight. She's still really, really struggling emotionally. I stayed up late watching, <laughs> no, I stayed up late snacking and watching 30 Rock, kind of in a pity party. <laughs> and I was like, oh gosh. Yeah, but well, it's kind of true. It's better for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's all over the place. My, it's, it's really interesting to read back all the time. It's like, dang it, like, I wish I'd kept this up when the pandemic started and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, ah, I've just like missed all that now. And it's like, oh, well, there's no time like the present. I should just like pick it back up and start it again. Well, since since we're doing or we're trying to do the pen of the week thing, you know, that would be a great thing for you to fill out like as you're using your pen of the week. And if you need to take, you know, it's not a bad idea to things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really good idea. And then I have, you know, just another couple of notebooks. This one is like two thirds full. Um, I was using this one as my daily one for a while there. And it's just like all kinds of random notes. I've got various ideas about, you know, just things at work, things at home. I clearly was just using this as like a dumping ground. Um, I was writing like more long form journal stuff, you know, goal setting stuff. It's all over the place. And I'm just like, oh boy, that's kind of a lot. I'm just gonna have to look into that. Um, And then I had another one here that I was using as like, you know, I'll call it like a prayer journal or something, just like, you know, things that I was reflecting on and, you know, just, you know, more, more like soft emotional things, I guess, or like whatever, but, uh, it's called emo. Yeah. I did not get as far in this one before I stopped using it, but I do like the color though, the blue, it's really nice. But anyway, this is just goes to show my various like things I've talked about before, which is like, I'm, I'm love to start a notebook and then just abandon it and then not know what to do with it. And now I have, you know, it's just reflective of my mind, which is all over the place. But anyway, look at that thing. Right. Look at this. This is this marvelous. And you know, on the back right here at the bottom of the cap, it just says brown. <laughs> just brown. That's great. It is. It is so great. It's the best thing ever. Pretty sure. Awesome. There uh, you go. So yeah, I'm you. curious y'all's feedback. What should I do with these notebooks that I've rediscovered? And then like, I don't know how you all feel, but I feel like when I haven't written in a journal a long time, I like feel like I need to apologize to the yeah. journal. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I haven't written in two years, but then I'm like, who am I writing to? I feel am the I same writing way. to myself? Am I writing to my kids who will read this one day after I die? Like I get really kind of lost as to like, what is the purpose of this journal? And then that's when I kind of lose it. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm human like everybody else. I definitely do not have it figured out when it comes to journaling. Um, so yeah, that's why we don't do a lot of journaling videos because I feel wildly unqualified to give anybody direction on how to actually use these things. But I do enjoy the process. I am just a bit lost. So anyway, I'm really curious to hear what you all do when you approach things, especially if you've tried a notebook and then you find it again and then how do you get back into it? I haven't really done that well in the past, but I'm curious to hear about it. Maybe I'll get inspired. Anyway. There we go. That's what we got. Very solid, long pen cast again today. But we want to thank you all for watching. Thank you so much. Giving us feedback, letting us know how we're doing. Let us know in the comments, sharing, thumbing up, thumbing down. If you don't like it, all of it's good. We just like hearing from you. So be sure to check out gulepens.com about a lot of the stuff that we've talked about here and all your pen, ink, and paper needs. And you can email us at goulet. Sorry. Email us at pencast at Um, And 
I have a fun random writing prompt for you all. If you want to pick up your journal you haven't written in in several years and just dive into it. What is a dream that you once had that you would want to live in forever? <gasps> oh, I know one. Yeah, you got one? Yeah, I once woke up, Brian. I, was, I had a dream that I had the Ecto-1 from Ghostbusters and I was driving it around. And no joke, I remember, this was so memorable to me because I woke up and I could feel the steering wheel in my hands and I could squeeze and I couldn't squeeze any more tightly than Whoa. like it was there. But then as soon as I relaxed my grip at all, it was gone and I, I could squeeze my hands again. But I was like literally squeezing and I couldn't squeeze any more. But then even the slight, like yeah, any slight let go and it was just, oh man. I, and it was so real. I thought I had it, Brian. I thought I had it. Wow. That's a good one. That's a good answer, Drew. Now this is all I have. <laughs> it's not true. I have several of these. Oh I have a Transformer, goodness. a Legos. I got, I have plenty. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. We're good. <laughs> I know you have more active ones than that. Yeah, I do. Oh man. I don't, I, you know, honestly, I don't remember the vast majority of my dreams. If I, you know, I'm assuming I have them, but I almost never remember my dreams. Oh, that's or not if bad. I do, I wake up and it's like, wait, I had a dream. Oh, it's gone completely. And I don't remember anything, you know, just, I, I don't know. Rachel remembers like, she's like, oh, you have like 10 dreams a night. And she can recall like almost any of them. And I'm like, yeah, not me. I don't remember them. So I literally can't even tell you like what's a great dream that I had that I'd want to live in. I can remember a couple of them. Like I had one in high school, like maybe six months after Rachel and I started dating and I was putting on a performance of some kind in my high school's gymnasium and uh, the pianist, because there was a piano in the gym, I don't know why, um, they said that Rachel was moving to Japan and I was 100% convinced that Rachel was moving to Japan. Nothing about the scenario made any sense, but I, I literally like, an hour later called Rachel and I was like, you're, you're not moving to Japan, are you? Cause I was like, <laughs> oh, no. it was just, it was one of those where I was just like so convinced that it was real that I was like, wait a minute, is this actually, is this actually happening? Cause you know, it was like, we were coming at the end of our high school and it's like, everybody yeah. was going to colleges and going, doing all these various things. But I, I, I had to actually talk to Rachel and confirm with her. I'm like, you're not moving to Japan, are you? So anyway, I would not want to be back in that dream thinking that no. Rachel was moving to Japan but that's, that's like one of the only dreams that I can even recall at all. It's weird. Anyway, there you go. So write about your weird dream or one you'd like to live in forever in your some lines a day that you had three years ago or whatever you got. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Glad to spend time with you all and right on. <laughs>